Hello, world. Hello, world. Hello, planet Earth. Welcome to Tea with Tosh. I'm Tosh. Our special guest is Bose Hadley. Thank you very much <laughs> for Thank coming. You, Tosh. Uh, you're an author of a book called Conversations with My Elders, right. which is conversations or interviews with uh, the uh, movie star, movie actor Sal Mineo, mm -hmm. uh, Lucino Visconti, the great Italian neorealist director, mm -hmm. Cecil Beaton, the famed costume designer yep. and photographer, and a good friend of Greta Garvold. Good friend. George Cooker, the great Hollywood director. Oh. Uh, and out of the blue, Rainer Werner Fassbender, the great German director. Right. And Rock Hudson, the, the, fi the ultimate 50s movie star. Right. Who needs <laughs> no introduction. <laughs> None whatsoever. Well, one of, one of the things I want to ask is, uh, why is the book called Conversations with My Elders? Good question. Um, the reason is because all of these interviews were conducted when I was between the ages of 18 and 28. Mm -hmm. I'm now over 30. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so all of these men, even Sal Minio, who was 32 when I met him, which is my age now, was obviously older than me. I was 18, he was 32. And uh, this was the concept, that they were all older men. Three of the men were old, old men in mm -hmm. their 70s and 80s. Three were younger. Mm -hmm. And the three who were younger died prematurely. Mm -hmm. well, uh, did you look up to these men before the interviews? I mean, were sure. you fans? Oh, or? yeah, definitely. Like Sal Minio, I'd seen him in Rebel Without a Cause, uh -huh. and Exodus, and uh, one of the Planet of the Apes uh, sequels. Uh -huh. And then George Cukor, I'd, uh, I mean, you, you grow up with his movies, uh -huh. uh, whether it's A Star is Born, Camille, Born Yesterday, Pat and Mike. Uh -huh. So uh, they were definitely people I wanted to meet and talk with. George Cukor, did you feel like you have to sort of go like this when you see I, him? I felt <laughs> like it. But he was very charming. He really put you at ease. Uh -huh. And uh, even though there was this uh, age difference of about 60 years, mm -hmm. he was never condescending and he was very willing to talk and to answer almost any question you might have. Almost. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. I mean, he'd say uh, all kinds of things about himself uh -huh. that surprised me, mm -hmm. but, but he, unlike some of the others, would not discuss certain of his uh, actors and actresses he mm -hmm. directed because he felt that uh, they should speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, Th this book has a theme, which is their homosexuality. All of the, yeah, all of these uh, six men were gay or bisexual. Uh -huh. Now, some of them were open about it in their lifetimes. All of them were open, at least, to their friends and relatives. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, for instance, Rock Hudson, um, it was known by his friends, by the industry. Mm -hmm. Even in Hong Kong, I was uh, at a tailor shop, a men's shop in mm -hmm. Hong Kong, and there was a picture of Rock Hudson trying on a new tailored suit. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese tailor said to me, oh, Rock Hudson, you want to know something about Rock Hudson? <laughs> and I could guess what it was. <laughs> you mean that he's six foot four? And he said, no, he doesn't like girls. And I said, hmm? You know, playing <laughs> dumb. And he meant he doesn't make love to uh -huh. women. So uh, yeah, they were all gay or bisexual. And that makes this book a first. And that's why Conversations you know, with My Elders you know, about, about Rock Hudson, ever yeah. since I was like in school, there's always sort of like, you know, the Jim Neighbors and Rock Hudson story. Right, right. I asked him about that. I asked him in the book about a lot of people, and he uh -huh. discussed almost all of them. Jim Neighbors, who would not discuss uh -huh. because that rumor had hurt him. And not so much him, but Jim Neighbors had his variety TV series oh, canceled. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the few things he did not. Well, let's start. Let's, let's have a picture of Sal Minio. We have a picture of Sal Minio. Uh, what do you find so interesting about Sal Minio? Okay, well, you have to remember back in the 50s, mm -hmm. he was one of the biggest stars in movies. Mm -hmm. He was getting about 5,000 fan letters a week. He was called the Switchblade Kid, and he was going to become another superstar. He was mm -hmm. a teenager. He was really the first teenager of movies, mm -hmm. and he was nominated for two Oscars, very popular. Mm -hmm. But then when he got into his 20s, it stopped, mm -hmm. and then it was just bit roles in movies. Mm -hmm. As I said, in Planet of the Apes sequels, mm -hmm. things like that. So he was very disappointed by that. Did, does he feel that his homosexuality hurt him in his career? No, or? no. He was, um, he was openly bisexual uh -huh. um, most of his life. And at the end of his life, he was directing and starring in plays with either gay or bisexual themes. Uh -huh. So uh, he said, uh, Hollywood knows, and I'm not ashamed of it. Uh -huh. But he had made that transition to being an adult movie star. Uh -huh. He kept trying and hoping. But as we know, he was murdered at 36. Mm. Uh, by a, a robbery, was it was? Yeah, he was uh, rehearsing a play here in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. 
and he'd been co-starring with uh, Don Johnson of Miami Vice uh -huh. in Fortune in Men's Eyes, uh -huh. and that was a very successful play. So then he did P.S. Your Cat is Dead, where uh -huh. Sal played a cat burglar, a bisexual cat uh -huh. burglar. And he walked home, and uh, he was murdered in front of his carport mm -hmm. by a guy who didn't know it was Sal Mineo. Mm -hmm. uh, he had just robbed a place, and he just stabbed him repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years later, was found out, and the guy was told whom he had murdered. Mm -hmm. But by then, the press had already speculated why was he killed, and there were all kinds of theories put forward. I mean, a lot of it's like a hustler type yeah, of situation. Yeah, really, but had nothing to do with that. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, uh, how about, Doctor, let's talk about like this county, uh, Lucino, Lucino? Lucino Visconti, okay. yeah. Now, how'd you, now, how'd you meet somebody like him? Because he's like incredible. I was in Italy, mm -hmm. and I had a friend, an Italian journalist, mm -hmm. and he said, would you like to meet Lucino Visconti? And I'd only seen two of his movies, The Damned and Death in Venice. Did you, did you have to think about meeting him? <laughs> no, no, because uh -uh, those two movies were incredible. Mm -hmm. So I said, sure, if he's not busy. And he mm -hmm. said, well, he is. He's directing a movie, mm -hmm. and he's in a wheelchair because he'd suffered a stroke. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it turned out, it was his last movie. Mm -hmm. But I got uh, to interview him two sessions at this hotel near Florence. Mm -hmm. And first, before I got to interview him, he had me agree to two things. I wouldn't discuss his politics. And that's because he was a Marxist. He's an aristocrat. Isn't he from an aristocratic family? He was the family? son of a duke. He was a uh -huh. multimillionaire, an aristocrat, and yet he was a communist. Why wouldn't he discuss politics? You think? Because he knew that if we published this in America, just bringing this up would turn 90% of the people against him. And then the other thing I couldn't delve into, and I agreed readily, was uh, his private life. He'd once been engaged to a princess, mm -hmm. and everyone in Europe knew he was gay. Mm -hmm. He didn't hide it. But being of that generation, he didn't go around discussing it either. Mm -hmm. so, so that was fine. We talked about the people in his movies, incredible people from Anna Magnani mm -hmm. to his friends like Maria Callas, Coco mm -hmm. Chanel, uh, Brando, Alain Delon, whom mm -hmm. he discovered. He worked with Brando? He wanted to. Oh. They knew each other, but they never got to work together. Oh. And Dirk Bogart, my favorite. Yes, right, right. He made a sort of a famous dramatic actor of Dirk Bogart. Oh, he's the greatest. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it was a very interesting interview. Uh -huh. And he did end up talking about his private life a little, including his long affair with the Italian director Franco Zeffirelli, who later came out. Oh, yeah. they, were, they were together then? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know they that. worked together and they were together mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. And then Zeffirelli <laughs> came out in The Advocate. And mm -hmm. now he has written an autobiography in which he also discusses Talks about Visconti. Visconti. Yeah. Oh. God, but, what, a, you know, what a aristocratic couple. Can you imagine like this walking down the street? <laughs> really? Oh, one thing that interested me about Visconti that he said was he, he never bragged about his wealth or anything, but he had a palace in Rome. He had a palace near Rome. Mm -hmm. He uh, never once in his life took a shower. In other words, it was always <laughs> sunken bathtubs. He never once had a shower. Really? Uh-huh. So you can never like, watch that grease off in the photograph of his hair being slipped <laughs> back, I guess. <laughs> well, that amazed me. I, mean, I couldn't picture anyone never having experienced a shower, but he definitely was from another time and lifestyle of wealth. Yeah, and his films show that, too. His work, mm -hmm. I think, shows that. It's like another era. Really? I really. feel that. You know, sort of that, Dan, the sort of that Baroque. That and, Baroqueness is definitely. And Baroque is a good word because he was Italian, but mm -hmm. as he told me, he was of German origin. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, I'm Italian and I love Italy, but I feel German. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in movies like The Damned and so on, mm -hmm. uh, it's all German themed. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about S Cecil B. Ted. Let's have a photograph of Cecil, who I think is an incredible photographer, underrated yeah. photographer, and a costume, a famous costume designer for. Uh, my Fair Lady? He won three Academy Awards, mm -hmm. more than any of the other people in this book, mm -hmm. even though he had the least to do with movies of all of these mm -hmm. six. They all worked in movies. But he was best known as a photographer, mm -hmm. the world's highest paid um, since the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And then he got into designing costumes, designing sets mm -hmm. for the play My Fair Lady. Mm -hmm. And then he did the film, and that brought him two Oscars, one for the costumes and one for the set. Mm -hmm. He also won an Oscar for Gigi, which he did with uh, Vincenti Minnelli, mm -hmm. father of Liza Minnelli. Mm -hmm. And uh, we discussed in the book some of the people he worked with. Like he really got along great with Minnelli. Mm -hmm. He did not get along well at all with George Cukor, the Why? director of My Fair Lady. They just Every clashed. Mm -hmm. Ironically, both men were gay, but they mm -hmm. did not get along at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
Beaton was taking pictures of Audrey Hepburn, the star, mm -hmm. for a photo book he was doing. And Cukor was dead set against this because mm -hmm. even though he was known as a women's director and he was very smooth and gentle, mm -hmm. he really maintained control on his sets. Mm -hmm. And he saw this as, you know, taking away from his conflict. Story. Yeah. Well, he also took some, he, he well, for being gay, he was, he was going to marry Greta Garbo. Cecil Beaton, yeah, Cecil Beaton. Uh, he corrected me about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he proposed to her. Uh -huh. They were friends. Uh -huh. um, she was at the time known as the most beautiful woman in the world, which if you look at her photographs. Yes, we have a photograph that he took of her. And this was taken in the late 40s? or This was 1946. When, when she, she wasn't being photographed. Right, she retired in 1941. Yes. And she was middle-aged by then, but uh -huh. uh, the whole world wanted photos of her. And so he was working for Vogue magazine. Uh -huh. So uh, she somehow agreed because you know how publicity, uh, she hates publicity. Did she, did she actually agree? I mean, yeah, she agreed did. to sit for one photograph. Uh -huh. He took a whole slew and said he would publish one. Uh -huh. Well, they published a whole slew. And so she... Got upset. Yeah, cut off the relationship. Uh -huh. Well, how realistic was that idea of marrying her? I mean, was it a real... I asked him, what, would it have been a marriage of convenience, you mm -hmm. know. And he said no, because he never desired... Oh, like they need the money, right? <laughs> yeah, really, really. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't need the publicity or whatever. More she, tea? She, please, yeah, especially since mm -hmm. we're talking about Sir Cecil. Mm -hmm. um, neither of them ever married, but he thought it would have been a great feather in his cap to marry the most famous actress in the world, the most beautiful woman was in the world. Was he vain in that sense? Yeah. Yeah. He was very much into uh, mixing with the what you would now call the jet set. Mm -hmm. And he, he once told me, I may not have been born with a silver spoon in my mouth, mm -hmm. but I managed to place one there. Well, yeah, what's his relationship with Mick Jagger like? <laughs> they, <laughs> they dropped acid together in the 60s. Oh, they dropped acid yep. together. He told me that. <laughs> I nearly dropped my teacup when he <laughs> said that. But yeah, <laughs> they did. Um, in the, you see, he really changed with the times as his photographs reveal. Mm -hmm. And he became friends with Mick Jagger mm -hmm. and David Bowie and Rudolf Nureyev, mm -hmm. who he said he had a crush on. And um, so he really kept up with the times and he worked almost till the very end. Died in 1980 and uh, he was knighted by the Queen. You also have phenomenal, it's like seeing early photographs when he was going to school. And yeah. like his makeup and stuff, is this wild. Really? That whole group of people. He right. was at Cambridge, and yeah. in those days people would pose in makeup and even in drag sometimes. Yes. And it had nothing to do with sexuality one way or the other. It was just a thing they did. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because he doesn't really discuss, uh, not in your book, but in any of the books I read about him, about homosexuality life. during yeah. that period. Well, and mostly it's just like, you know, guys you know, together wearing makeup and, you know, Yeah, that's it. right. He never denied being gay, but he was also of that generation as mm -hmm. three of the people are in conversations with my mm -hmm. elders, because three of them really were elders. Mm -hmm. um, he said, I don't believe in talking about sex, period. And he even told me that uh, in the 20s and 30s when he was growing up... He's like up, to do it, huh? Well, well, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's true. But uh -huh. he said sex was a word you only found in dictionaries and medical textbooks. You did not use the word. Well, how proper. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, really? Okay, let's talk about George Cukor. Oh, yeah. We're yeah. going down the list here. Mm -hmm. George, um, uh, what is he like? I mean, what kind of man is he? He was, um, when I met him, he was thin. Now, in all the pictures I'd seen of him directing all these great stars, mm -hmm. he was fat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked him about that, and he said, well, I think you should know that thin people live longer. Apparently, in middle age, he decided to become thin. To live. And he did live to be 83. Uh -huh. And uh, in his 82nd year, he traveled to China and to Venice to be honored mm -hmm. by film festivals. Mm. But he was a very charming man, very soft-spoken, but mm. very firm. I mean, you could tell that he, he would direct people like Catherine Hepburn, and he was absolutely the boss. He told me they would have arguments, but he always won because he knew what was right. He won over Catherine Hepburn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were good friends. <laughs> he directed her in 10 movies, uh -huh. and she was often a guest at his home uh -huh. up on Cordell Drive. Mm -hmm. Now, wasn't he supposed to work with Gone with the Wind? He directed one third of Gone with the Wind. And Clark Gable had him fired? Yeah, he what did. What reason? Well, I asked him about that, and he said the, if, the same thing he always said, that Clark Gable feared he would, that, that Cukor would favor Vivian Lee. Mm -hmm. Although Vivian Lee was a newcomer and Gable was a superstar. Mm -hmm. The real reason, which is in the book and is, has been confirmed elsewhere, mm -hmm. is that Cukor had been friends with an actor named Billy Haynes, mm -hmm. who had been a big silent movie star. 
at the time that Clark Gable was married to an older woman and was mm -hmm. known to be a gigolo. Mm -hmm. Clark Gable was heterosexual, but he once had an affair with Billy Haynes mm -hmm. for money. And so in the 30s, when Billy Haynes' career ended, and then Gable became the star, mm -hmm. any mention of Billy Haynes was like, you know, taboo. Mm -hmm. And because George Cukor was still very good friends with Haynes, who was now a top interior mm -hmm. decorator, mm -hmm. He kept pressuring, Gable kept pressuring Selznick, the producer, to fire him and fire him and fire uh -huh. him. So finally, after a third of the film was completed, they fired George Cukor. Mm, but but uh, Vivian Lee continued going to him for coaching every night. Uh -huh. so. She wasn't really fond of Gable, was she? No, w her biggest complaint was his smelly wooden dentures. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about Love, what's that, Fassbender, my, one, one of my all-time favorite movie directors, actually. Gee, he's a nice guy, isn't he? Well, he was an he's interesting sweet? guy. No. <laughs> that was the one unpleasant experience I had. What happened exactly? Okay. <laughs> I need something stronger than tea for him. But, um, okay, he was, I interviewed him in Paris in January, mm -hmm. 83 months before he died. Mm -hmm. he, he was known to be a workaholic. He directed mm -hmm. dozens of movies in 10 years single-handedly revived German cinema mm -hmm. to its eminence of uh, pre-war. At the time of his death, he made 30 films, wrote oh, yeah. like 10 plays, you oh, know, TV shows. Oh, numerous plays, TV. He also uh, produced, wrote, acted. An amazing man. And uh, he was a workaholic, but he was also an alcoholic, uh, cigarette addict, like 40 a day minimum, mm -hmm. and uh, very much addicted to drugs. And when I met him, he was very high on cocaine. We did an interview. Mm -hmm. He was so high on that interview that he wouldn't allow me to use a tape recorder. There was a paranoia there. Mm -hmm. And then I took him to dinner at a Vietnamese restaurant in Paris that night. And then he came back to the hotel room, I thought just for a few minutes, you mm -hmm. know. He stayed the night. He, what he did was he, he would keep going to the bathroom every 10 minutes to mm -hmm. do his cocaine. And then he fell asleep on the bed. Mm -hmm. And before falling asleep and snoring so loud, you, you wouldn't believe anyone could mm -hmm. snore that loud. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure the people <laughs> in the next room heard it. But he would turn on my radio that I brought along full blast. Mm -hmm. And I'd get up to stop it. And, and he was a huge man. I mean, he was like a, a grizzly bear, mm -hmm. you know, as you see in the photo. Mm -hmm. and, and he became very bellig belligerent, almost violent, mm -hmm. and accused me of all sorts of things, like being an ungracious host and a lecher and uh, mm -hmm. a bad interviewer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't get rid of him in, in, in the state he was in. I, so I just sat on my bed and just uh, watched him on the other one sleeping until 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm in the morning, and then I just uh, got up and said, you have to go now, I have to take my flight back to Was he US. nice then? I mean, is he sort of like a schizoid type of thing, or is this? When he finally woke up, then he s was like a, a child, saying, mm -hmm. oh, I slept so well, you know. And it's amazing, because he had such, I read a couple books on him, he had incredible cr charisma. People yeah. were just drawn to him, you know, do anything for him. He was very childlike in one way, mm -hmm. and in a, in a way you wanted to protect him, because after we were leaving the restaurant, Mm -hmm. walked to the hotel. He was walking and careening so wildly anyone would know that he was on something. And I was just afraid that um, he might get the attention of a crowd or of a policeman and then there might be headlines because so you, of who he was. So even though you don't really like this guy, you're still worried about him. Oh, of course, definitely. So be he, yeah. Because if he were just Joe Schmo, you know, who would care? Yes. But in Fassbender, I mean in Europe, Fassbender was far bigger than here. Yes. And uh, I could just see headlines next morning and of course... You Actually, I think he's such a bad boy all through his life. <laughs> I'm sure he was. <laughs> when heard him, but the, the amazing thing about him to me is that uh, Somebody who's you know absolutely screwed up most all yeah, the time. Yeah. How much control his films have? I That's mean, it, it, and that he managed to work at all that much. And it's amazing. It He's a phenomenal person. Thrilling. Well, let's talk about Rock Hudson. Oh yes, <laughs> who's uh, unfortunately famous for other other reasons now. Really? Uh, what was he like? Uh, he was very likable. Uh -huh. Now, unlike Fassbender, he was very charming, full of humor. Fassbender mm -hmm. had very little humor. Mm -hmm. Rock Hudson was very down to earth, very modest about himself. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you read the chapter you'll see that uh, he didn't take his work seriously or himself. He, j he was just into having a good time. Mm -hmm. And of course he eventually overdid on drinking and cigarettes mm -hmm. and also he was definitely promiscuous. Mm -hmm. Then after he had open heart surgery he still kept doing all these things way too much. Mm. So. Uh, some people have theorized that even if he hadn't died of AIDS at 59, he'd have died a few years later 
from what have you, just from mm -hmm. abusing his system. So he's not a quiet conservative. Well, he man. was conservative politically. He Is was he? very pro Reagan. Really? He was not for gay rights. Really? Why is that? Why, why something like him? I think it's because he came from that time mm -hmm. and from middle America. He definitely was middle America. Mm -hmm. he, d he never called himself Rock. He was Roy. Mm -hmm. He said Rock Hudson doesn't exist. He's a one-dimensional character. And uh, he was afraid of being found out on a national or international level. But was he aware, because like even as a kid, before I even knew what homosexuality, heterosexuality, right. you always hear like, you know, Jim Neighbors and Rock Hudson. Right, right. Was, he, was he aware of this too? I mean, that well, that there's, you know, there's ki kindergarten kids gossiping about Rock Hudson. I know, it's incredible. <laughs> Everyone knew about Rock Hudson, I think. Except, except him. a few little old ladies, <laughs> really. And uh, the thing is, see, he was, he was a superstar for about 10 years, like mm -hmm. number one or two at the box office all those years. Mm -hmm. And he was surrounded by people who were very protective of him, of what he heard and read in the media. Mm -hmm. Now, many of these men were also older gay men who were very closeted mm -hmm. and very protective of anything coming out. Mm -hmm. And and they maybe gave him a different picture of uh, how he was so, perceived by so the So basically, world. sir, he surrounded himself with gay, conservative yeah. men like him. De well, that's one thing you see in conversations with Mallers. Uh, these six men were all non-heterosexual, but that's about all they have in common. Yes. Some were conservative, some were liberal, some married, some didn't. Um, the other thing they had in common was they were really into their work. That was mm -hmm. the main thing in their lives. Mm -hmm. They were all very successful, contributed to their industry and to modern culture. I have another question. This is like a little gossipy question. Uh -huh. Why should I have a gossipy question in this show? <laughs> <laughs> um, how about uh, the relationship between, say, like James Dean with Sal Mineo or yeah. Rock Hudson? I mean, they both work with them. And there's been rumors about, you know, Dean's yeah, they, they were all in uh, the film Giant. Mm -hmm. Rock Hudson did not get along with James Dean. Uh, Salminio, however, worshipped James Dean and probably had an affair with him. Now, he told me about affairs in the book that he had with Rock Hudson, Peter Lawford, but he wouldn't say about James Dean. He said, that was very special to me, that I don't talk about. Peter Lawford? Yeah, right. <laughs> Bisexual. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the thing, too, you see. Everyone keeps saying, oh, uh -huh. these men were all gay or whatever. Well, well some were gay and some were bisexual. Mm -hmm. Some had marriages and girlfriends and love affairs. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, not one of these men had a child. Now, that's unusual for a group of six men. Which one? No, none of them oh, had. Oh, none, none of them. Oh. Which, uh -huh. you know, if you took an average group of six gay or uh -huh. bisexual men, one or two of them would uh -huh. have a kid. Hmm. None of these did. As I say, I think the work was the overriding thing in all their lives. Uh -huh. And has anything come up about Cary Grant? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there's uh, George Cukor discusses Cary Grant, uh -huh. uh, who brought a lawsuit against Chevy Chase mm -hmm. for calling him, quote unquote, an old homo mm -hmm. on uh, Tom Snyder's defunct Tomorrow Show. Mm -hmm. uh, Sal Mineo discussed him in terms of Everyone in Hollywood knew that in the mid-30s, Cary Grant was living with and supposedly having an affair with Randolph Scott, who mm -hmm. just died this March. Yes. And now there will be a book coming up, not by me, but uh -huh. a book coming up about that. Uh -huh. So yeah, Cary Grant's in there too. Hmm. How do you feel about like sort of like besides, well, including your book, the yeah. sort of publicity after they pass away? I asked Rock Hudson about that. Uh -huh. um, Charles Lawton, the great British director, mm -hmm. he was married for decades to Elsa Lanchester. Mm -hmm. After he died, she did an introduction to a biography in which she revealed that her late husband mm -hmm. had been gay mm -hmm. all along. I asked Rock Hudson, what do you think about that? He said, listen, once they're dead, it can't hurt their career, because that's the reason people won't talk while they're alive. Mm -hmm. And he thought people should know, they should finally get the truth, because they won't get it in your average newspaper or magazine. Yes, sir, interesting. A friend of mine who's gay mm -hmm. was talking about that, uh, I was talking about your book. Mm. And um, and uh, we found it interesting. He's like when he was growing up, he would like to know who, yeah, who was gay in the sense to, like sort of either role models or well, heroes. Or just, just it. there were none really. Yeah, were I mean, you're I so mean, isolated. You had to situation. go back to Leonardo da Vinci or someone. Oh, like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, but now it's it's pretty common knowledge that uh, not everyone gay in showbiz is a Liberace type. You mm -hmm. know the stereotype. It's also a Rock Hudson or a mm -hmm. X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. So, um, in, in that sense, the book is sort of, um, what do you want to say, opening doors or mm. something. Okay, is there going to be a second volume, a sequel? 
Well, because it's doing real well, I've been asked about that, and uh, there may be, but not for a few years. Um, any names you can mention? Well, guess? Quentin Crisp, who did our introduction. Oh, he's great. Yes, yeah. he did the introduction. I've, I've been interviewing him for years, uh -huh. so he'll definitely be part of the sequel. And in the sequel, I'm hopeful that not everyone in it will have to be deceased. Yes. You know, yes. as long as they're willing to be honest. Do, do you feel that, um, a fast question, do you feel that sure. um, uh, to be homosexual in the show business mm -hmm. in the world like these men are, yeah. were, their careers, were their careers actually hurt? I mean, could it be hurt actually if they did express their homosexuality? If For instance, like Rock Hudson, who yeah. seems like he might have a fear of it. Well, he had a fear of it, but see, he'd been at the very uh -huh. top of showbiz. Uh -huh. um, who can ever say, really? You can guess, mm -hmm. but who knows? Until someone does do that, mm -hmm. then we'll see what impact it has. Well, I want to thank you very much. Thank you, I really appreciate it. You'll come on again, won't you? Oh, I'd enjoy it. Okay, I wish we had an hour. I've asked several really? questions. Thank you very much, world. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.